Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Members Forum live tonight. From uh, Welcome to wherever you are. Thank you ever so much to, for joining us. Uh, hope you're all safe and well. Neil Snowball and Paul Farbrace are ready and waiting to take your questions. Many thanks to all the members that have submitted questions, and uh, we will endeavour to answer them all during the next hour. But first, perhaps, um, let's just get a brief summary from Neil and from Paul very briefly about an overview of this very strange situation. Perhaps, Paul, first of all, strange times for us all. How are the players and coaches getting along without cricket? You're on mute, Paul. There you go. Look at that. I've just given a two-minute intro and none of you heard a word of it. Fantastic technology. <laughs> um, well, look, good evening, Brian. I'll say it again. Good evening and good evening to evening. everyone. Who's, uh, who's joining us. Um, the, uh, it is a strange time, you're absolutely right. Um, and one of the things, and I've said this a few times recently, one of the things that we all love about the game of cricket is actually the team side of it. And I think that's the, the biggest challenge for all of us, not being together, whether it's members sat in their seats that they always sit in with their friends around them, chatting about the game, analysing selection, etc., etc. Players in the changing room chatting, exactly the same. The, the fun, the banter, and I think that's the thing that we're all missing more than anything. But uh, we, we've got some good systems set up, and we'll probably cover some of them later on in the hour. But uh, I'm pleased to say all of the players um, and coaching staff are, uh, are coping okay. But um, like the rest of us, they're looking forward to getting, uh, getting something at some point during this summer. Well, that will be wonderful, wouldn't it? What a joyful day that will be if it happens later this year. Thank you, Paul. Plenty more from you in the next hour, of course. But, Neil, perhaps over to you first of all. And first and foremost, what do you think about the prospects of getting some cricket at Edgebaston this year? Well, um, I think uh, w what I can say is that, uh, well, first of all, good evening, everybody. Um, what I can say is that everybody at Warwickshire uh, is absolutely determined to get some cricket played, if we can, in whatever format. Um, and whatever time of the of the season, but uh, there's certainly no no um, you know lack of effort and determination to to make that happen. Um, I mean, what what I what I also just want to say first of all, I just want you to uh, again welcome everybody, thank them for the time for joining us this evening, and I sincerely hope that you are all safe and well, uh, you your your family your your friends, um, and I know that this um, terrible pandemic's. Uh, affected all of us in in some way, shape, or form. So um, I just wanted to start off by saying I, I really hope that you're all all, all well. I think um, I mean certainly myself and my uh, colleagues at Warwickshire have been touched by the messages that we've received, uh, whether that's emails or or, or letters uh, inquiring as to how we're getting on and, and and how the players are and how the staff are. So you know really appreciate uh, those messages from from you on the um, on on the call. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as Paul said, I, I think you know it's important to retain a, a degree of uh, perspective when you you know read the news and you see what's happening around us and around the world. But fact is, we all love cricket and we'd love to be playing cricket. And looking outside and seeing the weather uh, that we've had in April and May, it's it's incredibly frustrating. But um, yeah, we'd uh, we'd love to get some some cricket going at some point. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say uh, again, those of you that were able to join. Uh, the members forum last week and, and hear from Alan, Alan Donald. That was terrific for, for everybody I know. Um, and, um, you know, we'll, we'd, we'd like to do more of those forums going forward. Um, and, um, and, and again, those of you that have been able to see it, I hope you've been able to enjoy some of the 2005 Ashes that's obviously been replayed on, on Sky and on the BBC radio. So uh, at least we've got some fantastic cricket from Edgbaston that we can... Uh, watch over the next uh, few days but uh, yeah th those are my uh, just intro comments thanks for all the questions and look forward to getting going over the next hour well perhaps we could um, start uh, with one meal that pretty much leads on from that which of course a lot of members have been asking it's a very uh, obvious and basic question what will be the plans regarding membership if there is little or no cricket in 2020 yeah, so um, this is something that, um, as you'd imagine, we've, we've, we've talked about a lot, we've discussed uh, within the, uh, the, the leadership group and obviously with the board. 
Um, and uh, as we sit here on the 7th of May, um, I think it's, it's difficult to know exactly what, what cricket will, will be played. Um, as I said in my intro, um, we're absolutely determined to, to get some cricket away at, uh, at some point. Uh, what we do know is there's going to be no cricket, obviously, before the 1st of July, um, with the decision that's already been made. Um, and, um, you know, we, what I can say is that there's a group of uh, chief execs from the first class counties, including myself, that have been asked to work with the ECB on a, a model for the season that could work um, and that, um, you know, could work at a domestic level, um, whether that's um, you know, championship cricket or, or 50 over cricket or, or, or blast cricket. So we are working to that. So I think at the moment, it's probably too early to make an absolute commitment on our plans with, with membership. Um, I think uh, what we, once we've got an idea uh, of, of, of how much cricket will, uh, will get played, uh, we'll, we'll obviously make some, uh, some announcements. Um, and I think we're looking at a number of options. There's options around some kind of reward uh, programme for, for, for members. Uh, there's looking at options for next year, whether it's some kind of enhanced a membership package. Um, also, there's there's a possibility of uh, members donating to the to the club. So we're working on a, a number of things. But the, what 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 I can say, which I think is really good for the game, is all of the counties are looking at this collectively uh, to try to 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 look after our seventy thousand members across the game. Um, and again, I've I've been touched by the emails that I've received or letters I've received from people, uh, you know, pledging their support to the uh, to the club. And I think that helps remind us that um, we are different to other sports in that our clubs are members clubs. Uh, you on the call are, are members. Uh, it's not like some sports that, where we just have season ticket holders. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we really want to, you know, work with you to support the club at what's a very difficult time. So, um, uh, that, so I, I don't think that gives a, a, an absolute response at the moment because I think it's just too early. Uh, but hopefully we'll get some good news at the weekend. We can start planning for the future and hopefully we can get some uh, cricket on and then we'll make some decisions and write to everybody in due course. Thank you, Neil. There are a number of um, uh, questions to come which uh, refer to membership in some way, yeah. so we'll, we'll certainly get back to this um, subject. The questions I'm just going to take, as, as with the Alan Donald one, they're just as they were as, as we received them, so they're uh, you might get anything at any time. But uh, thank you ever so much again to all the members that have asked a question. So let's start off with uh, a two pronged question from Adam Bloomfield. Um, I think this is probably for you, Neil, principally. Adam says, Do you think there will be future investment into the hundred to a point where it competes with the IPL, as was claimed after the postponement? This week, and the second part of the uh, question: Does the loss of major match day income during the COVID um, pandemic affect the long-term plans for Warwickshire and Edgbaston? Um, okay, so in terms of the the hundred, I mean, certainly th that that is a new um, flagship tournament for for the game. Uh, again, I know, and we've spoken about it at, uh, at previous members forums. Um, uh, there are some people who don't like the hundred. There are some people who have embraced the hundred, um, and I and I I honestly think it is a real it's a real blow that it's been postponed from this year. I, I think the early signs in terms of take up of, of, of tickets were positive. I mean, there was over one hundred ninety thousand um, uh, tickets sold to start off with, um, and I think the, the the signs were very positive. Um, so, will it become? <laughs> Will it become on a par with IPL? I think that's I think that's tough. I mean, IPL is unique. I mean, it's it's a fantastic product in an absolutely uh, cricket mad country, um, and it's uh, it's grown from strength to strength, and it's a it's a hugely uh, influential and powerful part of, of of the global game now, the IPL. Um, but you know, can the hundred um, you know grow and be a, a a really exciting tournament to sit alongside? The IPL and probably the Bash and the CPL. Yes, I think it absolutely can. Um, and and I think the thing that uh, people don't necessarily always appreciate is one of the major reasons that we uh, that we have invested in the hundred and the games invested in the hundred is because the ECB and the game in this country will will control the hundred. Um, the big challenge at the moment with the funding mechanism, and we've seen this over the over the last few weeks, is we're very, very reliant on the broadcast revenues and the broadcast revenues for Test Cricket. And Test Cricket isn't entirely with our control. Uh, we're relying on um, boards visiting from overseas. We're reliant on boards investing in Test Cricket. 
Um, and although we all love test cricket in this country, um, it doesn't have the same prominence around the world. So the, one of the big reasons for investing in 100 was to have a product that the, the broadcasters were interested in and would pay for um, and, uh, and that we control uh, going forward. Um, so, and then the second part in terms of the income, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a real blow uh, for, for us. I mean, of, co of course it is. It would be wrong of me to try to skim over it. I mean, we had a fantastic 2019. Um, we've uh, published our accounts. We had record revenues, um, record um, uh, profits, and it was a fantastic year for us. It set us up really well for what we uh, hoped would be a fantastic five years running through uh, from here with, again, you know, benefiting from those broadcast revenues and our exciting plans for the game. So um, it, it has set us back. Um, we obviously don't know the full extent yet because we don't know how much cricket will get played. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, what's happened is, is a blow to us, as it is every other county, every other sports club and, and every business. So, um, it, it, but, but in terms of our ambitions for our five years, we've still got an exciting five-year strategy, uh, which we... We're just about to launch um, and we've still got some really exciting plans for the for the stadium through our master plan which we were also just about to launch so they they will be revealed in due course but we are going to have to adapt those once we know the full scale of the um, of the of the uh, COVID impact. It is very difficult to look ahead isn't it which um, or too far certainly but so this makes probably this next question a bit tricky. Alan Plum thank you for your question Alan and he says Neil what would be the consequences Consequences of a complete write-off of the 2020 season or the 2020 season? Uh, yeah, well, I suppose that's an extension of, of what I've just said. It, 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 the the um, what what we what we're doing at the moment is we've been. I mean, ever since this started, we've been doing a lot of financial modelling um, and working with the ECB uh, to look and all the counties to look at the impact of this. So. Uh, what I can say is, although it would be incredibly tough, if there was no cricket at all, uh, Warwickshire County Cricket Club can trade through 2020 um, and we can survive through 2020 uh, and then move into, into 2021. So, um, you know, that's just to reassure the members, because again, I've had a lot of messages from people saying, you know, can we survive this? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can. But of course, it would be really, really uh, tough to, to do so. Um, but then the reason that we are as best placed as we can be is that uh, we did have a very, very good 2019. So uh, we benefited from 2019. We've got the money in the bank from that. Um, and uh, so that sets us up well. And also, I should say that we, um, we had traded extremely well over December, January and February with our pre-sales for this year, particularly for the Test Match and for the Ireland ODI and for the Blast. So, uh, and because the, the commercial team had done such a great job, those tickets are insured. Um, and so that sets us up quite well, if indeed those games don't go ahead. So yes, it would be a real blow, uh, but we can trade through it and, and come out the other side. Thank you, Neil. Next question is from Paul. Uh, and, and it's for Paul as well, I think, this one. Uh, looking ahead, how do you expect to cover the spin bowling options post-Jeets? Well, it's a very, very good question. I think that's something that every county and that the England cricket team are looking at very closely because, you know, we all know there's been lots of thought gone into how do we get spinners into the English game. It's a, The English game is dominated by seamers, um, particularly with the way the championship's set up. Um, you play a lot of games early season, end of season, and then you bring your, your four spinners into play when the, uh, the T20 starts. So, uh, but, but we have seen some spinners at other counties benefit. I mean, we, we at times last year played three spinners. So we, we have got Alex Thompson, uh, and I've got very high hopes for Alex. I think he's somebody that, um, that we can really develop into a genuine all-rounder. Um, we've got one or two young lads, um, and they are young boys, 13, 14, 15 in our academy, who are very promising. But there's a lot of promising kids out there that they've got a long way to go before we can start talking at this level about first-class cricket. So we do have a genuine um, issue going forward, um, and it is something we've spent a lot of time talking about, certainly over the last um, year or so that I've been at the club. So, um, you know, I've got no magic answer. I'm not going to make any promises. 
but it is an opportunity for Alex Thompson to keep developing and seeing where we can get him. Thank you, Paul. Another one for you here, actually, from Andy Darby, um, who asked a question which I think will be on many members' minds. Do we have many players who are out of contract after this, after 2020, and what are the plans for those players? Um, we, we do have players out of contract, and we have spoken to each of those players. Um, and, you know, the, the, the plan is that if you're in the last year of your contract, there is an appraisal system, which is... Uh, you know, rightly so, that that was brought in through PCA and with the counties. And so each player has appraisals throughout the year um, and, and you get an extra appraisal if you're in the last year of your contract. So all of the players are out of contract and there aren't too many, but those that are out of contract. Um, we're in regular discussion with um, and I've chatted to their agents as well in most cases. So, you know, we, all we can do is keep chatting to them. Um, and, and it's difficult because in some cases, you know, it's not necessarily about us offering them a contract. It's about them seeing a future and opportunity to play first team cricket. One or two of them, you know, would have probably played a bit too much second team cricket for their liking over the last couple of years. So it's not just a straightforward us saying, yes, we want to re-sign you. It's actually, we want to re-sign them, but also do they want to stay and do they see an opening at Warwickshire? And I think that's a, that's a key thing. And that's been one of the, the conversations that I've been having with those players. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, again, I can't make any promises either to the players or to the members about any of those that are out of contract. Um, but fortunately, we don't have too many. Um, but it is something that, as I say, we've been talking to the players about for some time now. Thanks, Paul. Next one is back to Neil. Uh, ben Phillips, thank you for the question, Ben. And his question is, how are the plans for the development of the Pershaw Road site being affected by the ongoing coronavirus situation. Is the work still likely to take place as planned? Uh, yes, the work will take place as, uh, as, as planned. So we've had uh, continued to have regular uh, dialogue with the developer, uh, which is uh, Patricia, and with our uh, various professional partners. So, and in fact, we just had a, a call with them last week to get an update. So, so the work was due to start in uh, June, July time uh, of this year. It was time to start uh, immediately after the, uh, the test match. Um, uh, but because of the uncertainty, uh, particularly around uh, getting uh, large numbers of uh, construction works on site and starting off the construction, that will probably get pushed back to the end of the, uh, end of the year now. So their current plan is to uh, appoint a main contractor um, and uh, and uh, finalise all of that and then probably start work around September, October time, which would give them the full winter to get cracking uh, before obviously we then uh, open for business for, for cricket in, uh, in, in April next year. But uh, yes, the plan is still to uh, very much to go ahead with that. Okay, the next question actually ties in nicely with one that's just come through on our live group chat. And please, if any members have got a question that isn't being covered, do get it in touch live. We, we are live at the moment. Uh, Simon Goodyear has just done that and his question is would the club welcome cricket behind closed doors and if so where does this leave the membership and, sim and uh, parallel to that Neil is a question from Carl Jordan who says uh, good evening Neil and Paul do you think with the county championship that would be the easiest format to watch regarding social distancing of spectators for example a space between each seat and also would spectators need to wear masks well, will they be supplied by the club? And will the restaurant be open? There's all sorts of um, tangents, isn't there, to this situation? Okay, so, uh, well, there's quite a lot there. So thank, thank you for those. Um, well, let, uh, let me answer Simon first of all. So would the, well, would the club welcome behind closed doors? I, I think, as I said at the beginning, we would welcome any kind of cricket at the moment. Um, as, as Paul was saying, you know, we've got, we've got a, a, a bunch of players there that are raring to go. Um, and, uh, and, and want to do what they do best uh, and what they're paid for, which is to, to play cricket, particularly those who've got something to prove who might be in the final year of their, their contract. Um, and so if, if that was behind closed doors, then, um, uh, then we absolutely we would play. So I think there's two sides to this. So let, let's look at the domestic side first. Um, so if we, um, if, if we have the opportunity to play cricket, and even if it's behind closed doors, we also have the opportunity to enhance the streaming service. So members will know that over recent years, uh, we've invested quite a bit to try to enhance that streaming service. 
uh, and there are other things that we could do to further enhance that which is not ideal by any means but at least it would enable people uh, members to to watch some um, some some live cricket so if there is the opportunity to play that behind closed doors then we would um but then also going on to the other point about uh, could championship cricket um, uh, provide an option to, to play with social distancing? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, we all see those photographs uh, every year in the newspapers of members in April um, dotted around stadiums with uh, lots and lots of seats in between them. So maybe county championship cricket uh, could, uh, could be an option to really give the, the country a lift if we can play. So... There's been some really good work done already on that. I've seen some fantastic studies of how you can do social distancing within the bowl, uh, within the seating bowl, uh, whether you have uh, single seats, pairs or, or, or triples, obviously people coming from the same family. Um, so I think actually uh, even limited attendances in bowl, um, I think could work later in the season. Um, I think the challenge is the process of getting to the ground. So obviously around public transport, about getting to the ground, about the areas, uh, like you mentioned about the restaurants and, and, and the like. Um, but there's, you know, there's a plan for everything. If there's an opportunity to do it, I'm sure we can work out a, a method. And, and also bearing in mind, you know, we, we know there's gonna be no uh, cricket until July, at least. Um, so that gives us the rest of May and June for us to see how the rest of society uh, starts to get moving again, you know, with social distancing measures um, and things like that. So whatever comes out of that, we, I'm, I'm sure that we've got enough bright people uh, to put together a plan for, for how we could do that uh, at, at Edgbaston. And in terms of uh, masks and things like that, we've already started those plans so that if we can get uh, our staff back to work, we know that we'll have to have extra uh, sanitizer, gloves, um, uh, masks and things like that. Uh, and we will do that, but again, not at the expense of frontline workers and HS staff. If, if it's appropriate for us to get hold of those and we can do that safely, then, then, then we will do. So again, quite a long answer, but I hope that demonstrates yes. the amount of thought and effort that's going into trying to get that cricket away towards the, the back end of the, uh, of the year. And just a follow-up question from Carl as well, uh, Neil. Uh, with no 100 competition until 2021, does that mean that there will be no first 11 games at Portland Road this year? And if that is the case, is it possible to play, uh, if it's possible to play second 11 cricket, will all those home games be at Portland Road? Yeah, good, very good question. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure most of the members on the call will be aware of the plans for this year, which was to play some uh, some first team cricket, some 50 over cricket at, uh, at Portland Road. Um, yeah, I mean, if the, if, the, if the 100, well, the 100 isn't going to go ahead now. That was the main reason for moving some of those games so if we do get some 50 over cricket away that will be played at Edgbaston um, I think just from the point of view of uh, operationally keeping it simple and trying to get uh, one venue up and running rather than two um, and, and, and again the, re the real disappointment is I mean Portland Road is is really shaping up well I mean I know again a lot of people on the call uh, will have been to Portland Road to see second 11 cricket in the past we know that we are, we've got a great square there we've got a good outfield um, but the actual spectator facilities were pretty poor um, and we've really worked hard to improve those um, and, get, and get those ready for this year. So, um, yes, if we, if we can get some second 11 cricket played, that would be played at Porton Road. Um, and uh, I'm sure the members, when, once they can get to, uh, to the, to the uh, community sports ground, will see uh, a, a significantly enhanced venue, which I think is going to be a, a real terrific venue for us going forward and that we can all be, all, all be proud of. Okay, Doke, one for Paul here um, from uh, Martin Webster, and he says, hopefully we will get some cricket in this summer, um, albeit maybe quite late in the season. How easy is it going to be for the players to be mentally and physically ready to go after this very strange time? That's a good question, uh, Martin. I think that the, the, the physical side of it, I, I think, is, is easier. Um, we, we've definitely had um, good plans. I mean... You know, the, the team went off to Spain um, to La Manga um, and the bowlers had, uh, had a decent run in to that, uh, that trip to Spain. So our bowlers were, were going nicely. Um, we'd had them bowling a lot more over the winter. We'd had them running a lot more. We'd had them on their feet a lot more. So, you know, that their level of um, physical fitness was very, very good 
um, at the middle of March. And we've had closed tabs on them over the last um, six weeks to make sure they've maintained their, their physical program. They've worked very closely um, with the S&C. So that they are physically, they're going well. Um, and we've had our bowlers doing mechanical work on their actions to make sure that they're um, doing everything they can to support the key areas of their body so that when we do start bowling again, they're ready to go. Um, the, the, the mental side of it, I think, is going to be our biggest challenge. And the longer we go without playing any cricket, um, I think is going to be a challenge for all of our players. Um, but, as Neil said earlier, that they are professional um, that you know, quite a few of them will have had injuries, and unfortunately, last year we suffered a lot of injuries. And during that injury time, it's a very lonely period when you're working on your own, hours in the gym, um, you're going through having maybe four um, lots of treatment in a day. So you come in early, have your treatment, you go away, you come back later, treat it again, um, and you do spend an awful lot of time on your own, an awful lot of time in rehab on your own. Um, so, you know, quite a few of them, unfortunately, in recent times, have spent a lot of time on their own, um, far too much for, for our liking, certainly last year. So that, that, that will help in some cases, but I do think that the, that the mental challenge for getting everybody back and ready it is going to be our biggest challenge. But as I said earlier, we, we've had what we call our wellbeing group in place now since uh, the back end of last summer, and we enhanced it at the start of this year. Um, so we've got four very capable and very good professionals working on a weekly basis on the well-being of our squad and, and they're doing a fantastic job. So we, we are monitoring our players on a daily basis and anybody that throws up any, um, any concerns, they're dealt with that day um, and there really is an excellent um, layer of protection and support for them. So, you know, I, I'm confident that we'll get them back um, mentally and physically in a good place. But uh, for some of them more than others, we, we'll just need to keep a very close eye on them. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, now, next one, uh, back to Neil. A question from Terry Wright. Thank you very much, Terry, for the question, which is, uh, does Neil still expect to take up his new job with the ECB in June? And uh, if so, uh, what is the progress on recruiting his successor? OK, um, thank you for that, Terry. Uh, so, yes, um, can, can you, I just muted myself, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the, uh, so the process has, uh, has been going on for, for, for some time uh, to, uh, to appoint a successor, uh, and that has continued. Uh, so that, uh, that process is, is coming to a, a conclusion, I think, fairly soon. Um, so that, um, uh, we would hope that that will conclude and then we can make an announcement as to who the successor is. Um, so that in turn obviously demonstrates that I am planning to take up the, the new role uh, with the ECB. So um, my start date for that was always going to be back end of June. Um, so that enables me to continue doing what I'm doing at the moment, which is to help navigate our way through uh, the current challenges and the, and the current crisis. So um, uh, that's, where, that's where we're at. It's been a very, very thorough process. Uh, probably won't surprise you that there's been a a lot of interest from a lot of really good candidates in the uh, in the role um, and uh, as I said uh, it's been very thorough process overseen by uh, Mark our chairman and, and, our, and our board so um, I would hope that something will be announced fairly fairly shortly um, and then obviously once they've been announced we can work out when they can start and then and some kind of transition from uh, myself to um, uh, to them so clearly you know, it, it was going to be difficult to uh, walk away from Edgbaston anyway, because I've absolutely loved my time um, at, uh, at Warwickshire. Um, and this isn't obviously the way that I would have liked to have gone without any, any cricket played. But, um, you know, we're all, uh, we're all having to deal with what's, uh, what's in front of us. Next up, um, Neil, another one for you, I think. This from David Kerr. And the question is, uh, with the, the likelihood that we know spectator has attended cricket this season, how will the finances of the club be affected? You've touched on that, I think. Uh, but will this delay the Edge Baston experience master plan or the Edge Baston master plan? Um, so, yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, thanks, David. We have, we have touched on that. Um, and yet, yes, it will, um, <coughs> it will have, a, have an impact on us. But it won't, it won't stop that ambition. I think I can confidently say that. So the, uh, the master plan that I outlined 
um, at the uh, the AGM. I think th those that were there could probably tell how excited I was uh, and am about that. It's a fantastic plan that would just take what is already a fantastic uh, sporting arena and uh, and just take it to a to a, to a new level. Um, so again, just to go back to to those plans. So phase one was what we did back 2010, 2011, and the creation of the South Stand. Phase two is the uh, development of the um, uh, the block of apartments adjacent to Pershaw Road. And as I've said earlier, that, that will still move ahead, even though that will be slightly um, uh, delayed in starting. Um, now, as part of that phase two uh, is also a transformation of um, what we uh, will call, it sounds quite grand, but the plaza, so that's the, the current car park area between the uh, where the apartments will be and the, uh, the stadium going right back right back to the very uh, the very end of the of the site uh, that's all part of um phase two and that that will still go ahead um so that new plaza the new car park the new um area will be uh, will be created as part of phase two phase three which we uh, described uh, that would probably start after the ashes in 2023 we hope can still go ahead there's still the ambition to do that a central part of that uh, phase three would be the hotel um, and it's still an, our absolute determination to uh, to do that. Um, obviously, finance is uh, dependent on how we trade through 21, 22, and 23. And then phase four was the very ambitious redevelopment of the RES Wyatt and the uh, and the city end of the ground. So, so that that plan, which as I said, we 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 gave the members a sneak preview of that at the AGM. We were due to unveil that uh, formally at the end of. April, but obviously we've uh, we've delayed that now. But that will go ahead. That launch, uh, as and when uh, as and when we can. Thank you, Neil. David Whitlock. Uh, good evening, David. Uh, he asks. Uh, he says hello. Both uh, have there been fruitful discussions with Birmingham City Council? Read the mortgage repayments due this year plus future years. Uh, yes, uh, they, they have, and, and actually, um, I should have said something at the beginning on that because they they have been terrific. I mean, as as uh, our members know, uh, we've got a very very uh, good relationship with Birmingham City Council. Uh, they're incredibly supportive, and in fact, in the very first week of the whole COVID crisis, the first full uh, week where it started to develop, um, 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 I was I went and met with uh, Councillor Ward, the leader of the council, to discuss. Uh, the club and um, in fact two things one was to discuss that the the, uh, the repayments uh, and also to discuss what we could do for the city uh, during the covid crisis which i'll come back to um, so yes we've had some very good uh, discussions they as always have been very flexible uh, in terms of us making whatever payments that we uh, can afford we were obviously in a good position at the end of 2019 uh, to make a significant um, uh, reduction in the uh, in the debt um, and uh, we'll continue to discuss the, with the council uh, how we phase those, uh, the, the, those payments. So yeah, they, they couldn't have been more supportive. Um, and then also they were extremely grateful for us uh, offering uh, the stadium and the, the area around the ground uh, for anything that we could do to help support the, the effort. Um, and, and obviously and it wasn't the council, but through the council and then the NHS and uh, Public Health England, uh, we were able to get the uh, the testing centre uh, on site, which um, some people will be uh, aware of. So, uh, and I and I, we, we, uh, Mark and myself got a very nice letter from uh, Councillor Ward thanking uh, the club for what it was doing uh, on that on that on that front. So, yeah, that that relationship continues to be very strong. Okay, a question now perhaps that both of you uh, might have a view on. It's from David Whittingham. Uh, evening, David, up in Yorkshire, I think, still. Um, the question is, how do you anticipate domestic cricket will look in the short, medium and long term, perhaps two, five or ten years, bearing in mind the impact of COVID-19 and uh, what planning may have been done already to tackle that? I'll let Paul go first and then I'll, uh, I'll follow. Well, I was hoping you were going to go first, then, Neil, as, uh, as the new man in charge of uh, county cricket as of the end of June. Um, so, well, I'll give you a few ideas, and you can uh, you can take them to your new role if you want. But I, I, I think I think one of the great things about county cricket, and it's you know, there's a lot of members on this call who have been involved in supporting their county club for a long time. There's been a lot of things thrown at county cricket. 
there's been a lot of tinkering, and I've said this many times. Every time England have a bad winter, um, there's absolutely there's problems in county cricket. County cricket always gets the blame, um, and county cricket can't get the blame for this problem. And and the one thing that I've seen over the last um, few weeks is that cricket has come together. Um, it spent a lot of time as a collective talking, working the best way through this um, horrific situation that we all find ourselves in. And as Neil said at the start, you know, there are some things that are far more important than the game of cricket um, and, and obviously people losing their lives. Absolutely. But in, in this situation, we have to look positively forward. We have to think about what we can do. And I think it gives all of us a chance to really understand what cricket needs. Now, I'm a massive believer in championship cricket. I've said that all the time. Championship cricket will feed our test match um, team. And I think that's really important that we keep developing our test match cricket. Um, so we need to stay with four-day cricket. Um, I, I wouldn't be against um, Neil bringing um, changes in lots of areas, but I would, I would like to think that he's not going to touch um, Division 1 and Division 2 cricket. I like the fact of having a top division. I think they've got it right now in terms of um, you know, more teams in the top division. I think that's definitely the way to go. Um, in terms of one-day cricket, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of 50-over cricket just because England need to win World Cups. And I, and I think T20 has developed um, to such an extent that I think that the game for me that we need to look carefully at is 50-over cricket. Um, and I wouldn't be against it even going back to 40 over cricket and it being played in, in an afternoon. So there's my, my radical one. But in terms of the actual game as a whole, I, I think the game will come out of this very strong. Uh, I think there's been a really, as I said earlier, a lot of good working together. I think the ECB as a whole have been absolutely outstanding. Their communication to us as a club has been top class. I think the fact that they've supported the counties and recreational cricket in the way that they have already in terms of financial work that's been done. I think that's been absolutely outstanding. The PCA have been very good in their discussions in terms of the players, making sure that they're supporting the game and they're not trying to trip it up in any way, shape or form. So I, I think there's been a, a lot of good. Um, but as I say, going forward, I, I don't think we'll see huge changes to the county game. I, I am a fan of the 100. I think the 100 is absolutely vital. Um, and as Neil mentioned earlier, we're, we're very lucky in this country. And, and there's been a lot of talk about playing behind closed doors. Um, my time with Sri Lanka, we played India in a test series in Sri Lanka. And if there were 100 people in the ground on any one day, uh, that would have been a lot. Um, so, you know, it, it, England, the England cricket team don't realise how lucky they are. They travel the world with fantastic support. They get full houses every time they play internationals in England. And a lot of countries around the world and a lot of first-class cricket around the world is played in front of absolutely nobody. So we've got a very strong game here in England and it's really important when we come out of this, we continue to have a very strong game. And I, and I think we've got some very good people making good decisions to help us do that. Okay, no, thanks, Paul. I've made a few notes there. So that's, uh, that, 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 that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Always available for any consultation. No? <laughs> No, and I, no, yeah, I think the other thing, so, I mean, you asked very specifically about short-term, medium, long-term, and I, I, I concur with, uh, with, with Paul's view. I think in the short-term, there's definitely going to be some short-term pain. You know, uh, for those of you that saw uh, Tom Harrison's interview with the Select Committee uh, the other day, um, you know, we are facing a significant hole uh, in the finances of, of, the, of the game, which um, I was going to say, I, I promised myself I wouldn't say unprecedented on this call because it's so overused, but... Uh, there is a very large hole that's never been seen before in, uh, in, 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 in cricket's finances. So there will be some short-term pain um, and, uh, and that will affect some of the really exciting work that was going to be done through the Inspiring Generations project. So whether that was um, around um, um, uh, South Asian uh, focus and the South Asian project, whether it's transforming women and girls, and also there was a significant infrastructure pot uh, which is going to help us uh, develop ground. So all of those things have had to be reviewed. So I think there will be some short-term pain. But as, uh, as Paul said, I think in the medium term, uh, as we, as we could come through this, which we will, um, um, I, I still think the game will be, uh, will, will be strong. Um, we've got some fantastic competitions. It was great to hear AD last, uh, last week talking about 
championship cricket, cricket being the best domestic red ball uh, competition in the world. And I still think it is. Um, you know, we, we there's a lot of people uh, criticise and challenge uh, what's uh, the view of the ECB and others when it comes to championship cricket, but it's still really, really important. Um, uh, Blast is a fantastic competition. We can do more with that. And, and again, as we've said, the 100 is going to be important. I do, I do, and I agree with Paul. I think 50 over cricket is what we need to have a good look at to look at how that fits into the uh, into the overall plan, not, notwithstanding the fact that we're the current current world champions. Um, but then in the, uh, in the in the longer term, as I said, we've got uh, you know a fantastic uh, long five year plan. We've got a great deal uh, with Sky and the BBC. I mean that's the other thing that we must remember that that um, the hundred was going to get live cricket back on on uh, terrestrial TV, which I think is really important. Um, so yeah, I think some some short term pain, hopefully a strong middle, and then a, a positive long term. Thank you both for that. Uh, let's crack on. We've got loads of questions and only 20 minutes. So uh, let's crack okay. on. First, let's do with Ian Venables. This is one for Paul, I think. Uh, what is the possible situation with, and have you been in regular contact with, Jeetan Patel? Now, I think obviously this is coming from the fact that Jeetan is a bit of a Bears legend. And there's also a, a live question just come through from uh, a, Alan Jones. Can you twist Jeetan's arm for another season? Well, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Look, I, I, yes, we've been in regular touch and uh, there, there was a massive uh, amount of messages going Jeetz's way today from the lads as it was his birthday. So, um, you know, he, he's been in regular touch. Um, I, I've spoken to him quite a few times. He was here. Um, he came back from Sri Lanka with the, uh, with the England team. So he did spend a couple of weeks here uh, with us in Birmingham, he, he, he was that committed to the start of the season um, that he didn't want to go back to New Zealand. He came here first and foremost, um, and that gave us a good chance to have a really good chat about obviously the way forward. Um, he is back in New Zealand now. Uh, he had to go back and isolate from his family for 14 days before he could uh, join in with his family. So that shows the commitment to the club, and 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 he has been. I mean, he, he's a you know in, in the current county game, he, he is a one-off. You know, his commitment to the club over a number of years, um, his passion, his loyalty to the club is, you know, is absolutely outstanding. And that was obvious for me to see last year, um, which was brilliant. So, look, he isn't going to change his mind. He is going to stay um, retired. He has got opportunities, I'm sure, that will come up um, around the world. He spent time with England um, over the winter and was a huge success. It, there's so many of the players have talked about the impact that he had on them within the team and not just the spinners. And that doesn't surprise me one iota. So he, he is very much looking at his next stage of his career as a coach. Um, and whether that's a full-time coaching role with England or elsewhere, and I'm sure he'll be in demand. So, you know, we won't be able to change his mind. Um, but I do hope that we find a way to have him back at Edgebaston at some point later this summer. And we do actually see him bowl some overs. And I said at the AGM, you know, it would be nothing better than to see him walk off the ground to a, you know, a, a, a large round of applause from all of our members and players to thank him for everything that he's done. It would be a, a real shame if he doesn't get that opportunity at some point this summer. Another player-related question, uh, Paul, from John Timpson, who says, uh, given our recent history of injuries to key players, particularly bowlers, of late, what is the current position with injuries? Well, the, the great news is that we've got a full and very strong group of bowlers who are desperate to bowl some overs. We had a couple of injuries on the pre-season trip to Spain. They're fully recovered. Um, so when I heard that one of our bowlers had gone over on his ankle in Spain and might be a month before he could bowl in a game, I was pretty despondent. Um, had I known what was coming, um, it, it wouldn't have been quite such an issue as far as I can see. But all of our bowlers are fit. We've got one young bowler who wouldn't have been fit to have played all summer. Um, but everybody else is fully fit and strong and raring to go. So, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, we have got them all working on the mechanics of their action. That doesn't mean changing their action. That means being strong and doing their fitness work to make sure their core areas of their body are strong. And some of them have actually been turning their arms over. Those that have got gardens big enough have been doing exactly that. Some have found nets, um, you know, that they've hung over their washing line and other such things and been bowling balls into. So, you know, they are, they're all active and they're just desperate to get out and play some cricket now. 
Two questions uh, that I'll put together, if I may, from Louise Miller and Sue Holden. Uh, Louise asks, uh, what is being put into place to support staff and volunteers' mental and physical well-being uh, by Warwickshire County Cricket Club? And Sue uh, asks, how are the players coping mentally and physically with the lockdown? And are, are all players and staff at Edgebaston safe and well? Okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off and then I'll, I'll hand on to Paul on the, the player side. So, uh, yes, I can confirm that the uh, all of the staff are um, are safe and well. Um, um, again, there's been a fantastic rallying effort amongst all of the staff to, to stick together through all of this. So um, we we have furloughed uh, the majority of our of our staff using the uh, uh, accessing the government's job retention scheme, um, and uh, we are in regular very regular contact with them. Fortunately. Um, at the back end of this year, and Paul was very much involved in this, we uh, we invested quite a bit of time and effort into a, a, a mental health program for our staff anyway at, uh, at Edgbaston. Um, and that involved uh, people coming in, giving talks, it involved online support, and also training up some uh, staff as mental health first aiders. Um, and so actually that turned out to be really good timing because all of that was in place uh, as we went into this process and as people then had to to work remotely so uh, all of those things have been uh, have been in place um, and uh, and we've been offering uh, really good uh, regular support to uh, to all of the staff um, the, there are quite a few staff that have been directly impacted by the uh, by uh, COVID-19 in terms of um, you know friends and family who've uh, who've, who've been uh, ill or, or some who've sadly um, lost their lives so um, um, we've we've monitored that very carefully, um, and uh, but as I said, we, they are safe and well, um, and they are desperate to, to come back. And in, and I, I, I touched earlier on the um, the testing centre. So just for those that aren't aware, we've got a uh, an on a drive through testing centre in the car park at Edgbaston, uh, which is uh, something that we did in partnership with uh, Department of Health and uh, and Social Care. And I um, I've been uh, up there a couple of times obviously in a safe environment and with my mask on to have a look around. And it's very, very, very um, uplifting to see uh, Mo Benaris and a lot of the familiar faces that you'll all know, uh, the members will know from the club who are actually working on that site uh, as stewards, because it's effectively been operated uh, by G4S and by our stewards. So it was just lovely to be able to go there and, uh, and, and see them uh, operating and doing an absolutely fantastic job. And, and I think that's given them a bit of an uplift in terms of being able to actually do something. Um, and also uh, from tomorrow, uh, we're working with um, an organization called Thrive Together, uh, which supports uh, various food banks around the city. Um, and uh, we're actually uh, using Edgbaston as a sorting center for donations of food uh, and, and other products. Uh, and, and some of our furloughed staff um, are able to volunteer uh, to help with that and so again that's going to give them a bit of a, an uplift as well so uh, yeah a lot of work going on in that area and uh, thankfully so far fingers crossed everyone's okay brilliant uh, and just carrying on with that brian the, the other the other part of that in terms of the staff um we, we set out um on the 2.6 challenge um from last weekend or weekend before um and quite a few of us have been there's over 40 staff have been involved in this 2.6 challenge which has been brilliant because we, we've all been raising money um, and we're raising money for two charities for the, the QE hospital and for NSPCC which is fantastic they're two of the um, the, the, the charities that the the club support anyway through the foundation so that that's been brilliant the, the money raised has been excellent but actually bringing staff together to do things there's been 11 of us running a marathon over 10 days and I'm really pleased to say that it finished on Wednesday and if Matt Collis has any more great ideas I'm never going to take part in them because by the end of it I, I was struggling one or two of the younger ones were, do, were going brilliantly um, Tom Rawlins running 25 miles a week to piece of case for him he's been doing that three or four times so uh, and there's been others have been baking cakes people have been doing um, press-ups in their gardens and all sorts of stuff and it's been it's been fantastic and as I say it's brought the group together it's shown the real spirit of Edgebaston which is legendary um, but it has been great to keep people united players have been involved in phoning members as well uh, which Tom Rawlings started a few weeks ago that's gone down 
really well. I spoke to quite a few members um, and just we just had chats about, you know, looking forward to the season. They shared thoughts. We talked about players gone by and matches gone by, what the club had meant to their families, how they've been taken there as kids and now they're taking their kids and grandkids. And it's it's it was just a nice thing to do. And players have been doing it. Coaches have been doing it. So that, that's been really good as well. Um, that there's, there's been a lot of good things going on. And as I said earlier, we, we have our wellbeing group. We're looking after our players, both the, the men's squad and the women's squad. There's a lot of good work going on with all of the age group kids as well. So um, Paul Greetham had started off putting challenges together. There's been webinars for all of those kids to dial into. We had one last week, which was Ian Bell um, chatting with Dan Mosley about his winter with England under 19. Belly had been the coach. And Dan, obviously, one of the young players, got 100 in the last game against Sri Lanka. So that, that was a webinar that went out, a Q&A between the two of them. Fantastic opportunity. There's been one with Izzy Wong, um, Liam Norwell, Hannon Dorby and Richard Jones about fast bowling this week. Um, we're hoping to have a batting one next week, which would be brilliant. So th there's been a lot going on and we've been able to tap into a lot of people. We've had some outside speakers come in and talk to the playing groups. Um, so that there has been genuinely a lot of good stuff going on and, and it's very, very important that, you know, we do keep people linked together and talking. We can't be together physically, but we can be mentally to help one another out. Indeed. Thanks very much, Paul. Now we're getting close to the, uh, the scheduled hour. We are going to go a little bit further beyond that uh, because there's still quite a few questions um to answer that i'll put the next two together if that's okay because they are quite connected it looks beyond uh, the bears actually michael ratcliffe um asks how committed is the club to help maintain the current 18 counties setup and ken mckay um asks do you envisage any county championship side going into liquidation if no domestic cricket is played in 2020 uh, okay, no, very, uh, uh, very important topic. So, um, I mean, in terms of, well, f first of all, let's start with, with, with Warwickshire because that's our primary focus. So we have been um, working very closely with the ECB. I think it was well documented that very early on in the, uh, in the process, the ECB put together um, a support package, an emergency support package for all of uh, the 18 first class counties. Um, some of that was bringing forward uh, core funding and some of it was additional funding to just you know, help through um, the early stages of the, of the COVID crisis from a, from a cash flow perspective. So um, you know, that, was, uh, that was extremely um, uh, welcome. Um, in terms of then what, what, so that's from a, a Warwickshire point of view, we're now going through a, a next stage of that, which is to do a very, very detailed review of our plan over the next 18 months. Uh, working on certain criteria or certain assumptions um, and that enables us to look at our sort of medium term uh, cash flow it looks at our medium term uh, p l and, 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 and balance sheet and that's and all 18 first class counties are doing that so the ECB can basically look at um, the, the, the the potential challenge um, and then look at how we uh, 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 how they can support that now Having said that, the ECB are also potentially facing a significant hole in their own revenues if we don't get cricket away, uh, because obviously so much of the revenue for the game comes through broadcast. And, and although we have a fantastic relationship as a game with uh, the main partner with Sky and also with BBC, um, you know, the, the, any, any rights that they pay are for uh, the rights to, to, to live cricket. Um, and so we have to obviously deliver some of that uh, this year. Um, in terms of the sort of the, the viability of, of counties, um, again, we're all very different. We're all, uh, we're 18 different businesses. Um, and I think this time, again, it's probably no secret from those that have followed this through the media. Uh, I think traditionally, uh, the, the counties that have really struggled have, those, have been those with the smaller grounds and that don't have necessarily the, the opportunity to host uh, major matches or have significant non-cricket businesses such as we've got at Edgbaston with conference and events um, and traditionally just from a cash flow point of view they're the, the businesses that have struggled and they will struggle uh, because of the, the lack of cricket however I think this time around uh, the venues that have been hardest hit are those that actually ironically are the ones that have done a better job of diversifying their business 
Um, and uh, so those that have built hotels, uh, those that have got significant non-cricket businesses such as uh, conference and events, um, they've been hardest hit because those revenues have just stopped um, overnight. So, um, so it's it, it's tough. It's tough for, for all of them. Uh, I mean, even the, uh, the the wealthy clubs like the MCC and, and Surrey, you know, they've got big uh, construction projects going on at the moment. That's hit them very hard. So, so nobody is is unaffected by this. But um, at the moment, the plan is to keep it together um, and and support the 18 first class counties. But as we come through this. Um, you know, everybody's going to have to be able to demonstrate that long-term financial viability, uh, as, as, as all businesses will have to. Thank you, Neil. Another one for you here from Jonathan Collett, who uh, says, first of all, best wishes to all at Warwickshire. Now that the 100 and its city franchises are almost upon us, albeit next year, can we please go back to playing as Warwickshire in all competitions we participate in? That is our heritage, identity and brand. And Jonathan also asks, can we remember that our club represents all the historic county of Warwickshire, including Birmingham, and do more to reflect this in communications? Yeah, um, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's a, 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 a regular theme um, for, for the club. So, I mean, I, I, I mean we, we talk about heritage. I, I, I agree. We've got an incredible uh, heritage at Warwickshire. Um, we're very, very proud of our roots for going back to 1882. Uh, and the Bear and Ragged staff and everything to do with Warwickshire and and you know even though I'm a, only a, a sort of a, a recent convert to the Bears I know just how important the Bears are and I've absolutely loved being part of the Bears for the last four and a half years um, so I take that heritage very seriously um, and if you look at what we did last year in terms of celebrating the, uh, the, the the treble and the great 94 side I think that demonstrates that um, you know, I, it, we, we can have the debate again. The, the blast, the, the Birmingham Bears is about the blast. The blast came about in 2003. We're very proud of what we've done since 2003. Uh, and obviously, you know, winning it one year, getting to finals as well. So that's a relatively short period of our, our history. So I would challenge anybody uh, to challenge me or anybody at the club who isn't proud of the heritage of Warwickshire in terms of county championship cricket, in terms of one day cups and everything that we've done in the past. Um, I think the blast is quite a unique uh, element to that and is, is relatively uh, recent. Um, so I, I don't foresee us uh, moving away from uh, Birmingham Bears uh, necessarily um, in, the, in, the short, uh, in the short term. However, the other, um, the other point about uh, Warwickshire and Birmingham, I absolutely agree, Jonathan, and, and it's, um, it's something that our board constantly remind us about. Uh, it's something that we're, we're mindful of is it's not entirely straightforward because most counties have a very nice neat boundary uh, and you know that they focus on that boundary obviously we have got um, we have got the county of Warwickshire uh, we've got the, the the city of Birmingham uh, and we do talk about the West Midlands a lot because we know that a lot of uh, from the West Midlands gravitate towards Edgbaston whether that's as members of Warwickshire or to come and watch uh, major matches uh, and, and hopefully would have come to see the, the, the Birmingham Phoenix play as well. So um, it, it isn't entirely straightforward, uh, but we love Warwickshire and everything about Warwickshire. Uh, we love the Birmingham Bears. Uh, we've embraced the Birmingham Phoenix. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a good reminder that we do need to remember, you know, all of our members in all parts of the county and the, uh, and the city. Thank you, Neil. A question now for Paul, I think, about recruitment from Terry Ritter. Thank you, Terry. And uh, he says, a number of players have changed counties, uh, but we do not seem to be in the market at the moment, which I find surprising as we now have no experienced opener to replace Dom Sibley when he is away on international duty. And it was our opening partnership which saved us from being relegated last season. Very good question. But I, I said at the start of last season one of my absolute goals was to make sure we had a spine of homegrown Warwickshire players in our championship side that that was that's a goal that doesn't change one iota for me um and luckily last year that the, the good side out of the injuries was that we were able to play a lot of our young players in the side and I think we saw in Rob Yates somebody who is destined to be I think one of you know, our best young players um, coming through, that there's no question. You know, I think technically he's excellent. I think uh, 
he's got a fantastic cricket brain. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see him being a, a captain of the club in, in future years. Um, and he's got that inner grit in him. Um, I sat chatting to Alistair Cook about him during last summer. He, he said he's one of the best young players that he's seen in recent times. So, I mean, that supports my, my theory. I, I think we've got an opportunity. And Neil mentioned earlier there might be a bit of short-term pain. I think that we have this opportunity now, having played so many of our young players last year through injury, to start to develop a few of those within our side. Now, I am ad adamant that we want to be challenging for the county championship and every other trophy out there. Um, last year, that wasn't possible. And one or two members said I was a bit harsh on the players at the members forum that we had. Um, and that, uh, but I, I think that despite our injuries, we didn't play as well as we could have done last year. I was very disappointed with some of our performances. And I think we've got a lot of work to do to be challenging before we are challenging for trophies. And, and yes, we would love to make the odd addition to make sure that we are signing good players, good players who add good character. My, my biggest concern is that we don't have a great deal of experience, but you know, the hope was that we would have Ian Bell back this year, who would make a, a huge difference to our young players in our batting order. So look, we, we, we may not be in the market just yet for players, and a lot will depend on where we come out of this from a financial point of view. But let me rest assured, that doesn't mean to say that we're going to just accept that we're just going to uh, stay in the middle or the bottom end of any competition. We want to be at the top. We want to be challenging and we want to be winning trophies and giving members everything that they want. Um, but we may have to be a little bit patient and we are desperate to produce our own players and have more players like Chris Wokes have come through the system, play for Warwickshire and play for England as well and win a few trophies along the way. That, that is without a doubt the, the goal and will always be the goal of the club. Thank you for that, Paul. Another one for you now. We are just going to go on till 10 past seven, everybody, by the way, because we've got a few more questions to fit in yet. So we're going to stretch it out a little bit longer. Um, this one is for you, Paul, from uh, Eli Z Farm. And uh, Eli, thank you for the question. He says, uh, I'm not able to get out much at the moment. So I was leafing through a wisdom the other day and came across a scorecard, Middlesex versus Essex at Lords in 1991. Now, uh, I know you were a wicketkeeper, Paul, but in this match, it says Gooch caught Rosebury bold far brace for 106. How did this happen? Brian, look, we've only got eight minutes um, because I, I could fill the hour talking about this. Uh, very kind of you to call me a wicket keeper. One or two referred to me as a speed hump that I used to slow them down rather than catch them. Um, but I, I did have an over, about one over, well, sorry, one spell, four overs at Lord's. Um, and Graham Gooch, number one in the world. I bowled pavilion end, as all good off spinners do. Got one to drift, turn, and took Gucci's uh, edge. And uh, Michael Rosebury at deep mid wicket um, took that edge. And um, I, I finished with four overs, one for 64. Essex got 125 in 22 minutes. Um, so uh, I said I'd never want to bowl again. That was the end of my bowling career, Brian. But thanks for asking that. And whoever sent that question in, who, who was it again, Brian? Just say Eli, the name again. Eli Z. Farn. He's a long-standing Warwickshire supporter. Excellent. I, I look forward to having a good conversation with him. I'm more than happy to talk him through the whole day if he wants to. Uh, Neil, back to you for this one. I think it's a question from a Neil as well. Neil Smith, um, going back to 100, in the light of suggestions that equity stakes could be sold in 100 franchises, would the club be prepared to commit that it would never use its vote or influence to allow or encourage any equity stake in any aspect of cricket without the agreement of members? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question and it, and it seems to be quite a hot topic at the moment. I mean, um, we, uh, we, 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 at the moment, we have a weekly uh, call with all of the First Class County Chief Execs just as we navigate our way through the, the, whole, um, the whole crisis. And uh, this was, question was asked to Tom Harrison this, this week because there's obviously been speculation. So this is... Um, from the horse's mouth. So, look, the the ECB is not courting any private equity um, or uh, uh, foreign investment or overseas investment or IPL investment, things like that. However, um, I think it's a I think it's a good sign for cricket that uh, that people keep approaching cricket, and so approaches have been made. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of speculation. There was a report the other day by a company called Oakwell, who I've never heard of, 
uh, about equity stakes and things like that. Um, so, so look, I, I think there's always going to be an element of noise around that. I think there's always going to be an element of noise, particularly around that with the hundred, because it's a new, a new format. Uh, but uh, just to reassure Neil, if there's uh, if there's any discussion to be had about anything to do with 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 Warwickshire and Edgbaston, then obviously that would need uh, proper consultation. But I, I I honestly don't see that happening um, in the uh, in in the immediate future. But I think there's always going to be speculation. Thank you, Neil. I think we've now reached the last question. Apologies to anyone whose question specifically hasn't been uh, read out. I have tried to put some together, of course, just for time reasons. So uh, hopefully everything has been covered, except for that of Walter Carruthers, who I think this might be one for you both to answer, chaps. And uh, Walter says, why does Edgebaston appear to have more results in test matches than most grounds? Uh, or is this only an illusion? I think it has. Actually, that is a fact. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start this time and then I'll let uh, uh, Paul uh, comment. You, you're talking about test match results, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll also throw over to Tom, who's a bit of a stato uh, on, uh, on, on, on this. Um, but look, I mean, I, I think it does. Whether, whether it's uh, actual positive results or just exciting test cricket, I mean, I, I get asked about this quite, quite a lot. And in, and in my um, relatively short period with the club, it's something I've absolutely loved. Uh, I, I love the fact that Edgbaston is renowned for providing, you know, exciting Test cricket, um, and um, you know, I, I just think it, it. But I think it's, I think it's a combination of things. I, I, I do think it's a lot to do with the atmosphere. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've been checking in and out of, of watching the 2005 Ashes. Okay, that was a unique uh, series, but even in, if I look back at some of the other, the other, the other games, even non-Ashes games, the atmosphere at Edgbaston is always. Is always terrific. So I think that must give the players a lift. I remember, in fact, when I first met Paul, when he used to come with the England side, we always used to chat about that and chat about the, the facilities and the environment and, 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 and what was special. So um, I, I don't have the, the stats to say whether it, there, there are more results, uh, but positive one way or the other at Edgbaston, but I know there's always some very special uh, test cricket played. Now, I remember back to my my first year as uh, as chief exec when we we had Pakistan, and um, I remember on the first day um, a lot of ex extremely well respected Sky commentators uh, were giving the uh, the club and the pitch a right or kicking on the first day, uh, describing it as a disgrace of a pitch. Uh, and then um, I, I, I enjoyed speaking to them on the last day when it was an absolutely classic Test match that went to the final uh, hour of the final day. Uh, with an England victory, um, and so <laughs> you know, I, I, as I always say, Edgbaston always, uh, always, always delivers, and, and I'm sure it will for many years to come. But uh, Paul, I know, has obviously got some more first-hand experience than I have, of, of obviously, on the actual um, the playing side. I, I think there are two reasons, and you've touched on both, Neil. I think it's a fantastic cricket pitch. There's always something in it for everybody. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, it's always going to turn a little bit towards the end. And it's a good pitch. It's, it's a very, there's a little bit in it to start with. Days two and three, fantastic batting pitch. And then it starts to turn as, as the game goes on. You, you can't ask for any more than that. And without a shadow of a doubt, atmosphere-wise, it's up there. Lords is an occasion test match where there's that constant hum around the ground during the test match. But Edgebaston, it's a proper, proper, well-supported, fantastic atmosphere. And the amount of players that talk about the Saturday at Edgebaston as being the place to be, uh, it, honestly, it, it's, it's not a myth. It's not made up. Um, and the other thing which goes a long way to the England team winning lots of games there, they genuinely feel like it's a home venue. And that isn't always the case at every venue. So they're made to feel welcome. It's a fantastic cricket pitch. And the atmosphere is sensational. So um, that's a pretty good ingredient for me for any test match, to be fair. No wonder there's so many uh, um, winners there. That's great stuff. Thank you both very much. I'll just come back to you both just very quickly for a, a farewell comment in one second. Just thank you all members for joining us. That's all the questions I think we've had today. This time next week, um, Trevor Penny will be joining us live from Vancouver. So please do get your questions in. That, that promises to be um, a really fun hour with Trevor, a great man from the 1980s and, of course, the 1990s. So do join us next week at this time, Thursday the 14th at 6pm. 
and uh, get your questions in for Trevor. Neil, thank you for joining us. Have you enjoyed it? I have. It's been terrific. It's, it's just been lovely to engage with members and to talk about cricket and to talk about the club. It's, you know, it, it's, it's been really, really refresh, refreshing and, and uplifting. So thank you very much for everyone that's uh, taken part. Thank you for the questions. Um, I know we're going to keep doing these uh, regularly and I'm sure we'll do another one with uh, myself and, and Paul at some point further down the line, hopefully when we've got some more news and hopefully um, that might be uh, good news about getting out on the, uh, on, the, on the pitch again. But no, thanks very much and, and do um, stay safe uh, and stay well. Yeah, Brian, I would echo exactly those thoughts. It's great to talk cricket. Um, you know, I, I'll happily stay until nine o'clock tonight. I, I think it's brilliant to chat. It's brilliant to share where we're at as a club, but it, you know, it doesn't surprise me we've got so many members keen to come on, ask good questions and find out because that for me, you know, it is, as I said earlier, the great thing about this game is we're all passionate about it. We all love it, whether it's the chief executive, whether it's the you know, guy in charge immediate, whether it's a, a member, we all care passionately about the game of cricket. And that's the thing that brings us all together um, on the Thursday evening chatting about the game of cricket and long may it continue. And thanks to everyone for their uh, their support and questions tonight. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Paul. We're getting a lot of lovely messages uh, on the group chat thanking uh, us for the forum. And, but it's been wonderful. Thank you very much for the, me the members. Some lovely questions, some really interesting questions. And it's just great to get the Bears family together like this, isn't it? So hopefully we'll do it um, again soon. So everybody stay safe.